Okay, a couple things to do today. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is, is uh, um, give you a little uh, lecture that came from uh, f about five questions that happened in my office um, on model view controller. And then I'm going to do rotation around an arbitrary axis, which is uh, kind of a fun little thing to do. Uh, um, it takes lots of blackboards with drawings and things like this to get done. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is something called model view controller. Model view controller, this is something called a design pattern. It's, a, it's a, one of the design patterns in software. Those of us that write a lot of software, right, quickly find the things called design patterns. There's a book out there by, called Design Patterns, which is a very, very famous book written in the 1990s. Uh, won all kinds of software engineering awards and, and everything. And what it is, it's a set of patterns that you can use to write software. Uh, there's publisher subscriber patterns, there's viewer, there's, there's subject observer patterns, there's model view control patterns, there's singleton patterns, there's composite patterns. There's all these patterns that we use. We tend to write our software using these patterns. If you write your software using these patterns, it turns out it's actually very easy to write in general, and it's very easy to de debug. And many of these patterns, once you write them, once you write one subject observer pattern and, and it works, or one publisher subscriber pattern, it works forever. And you can just put it in your code and start using it uh, to communicate between software modules, etc. cetera. Um, I use a ton of these things in my code, and most people do. And most people that write, um, most people that write software that have to do with graphics or anything visual on the screen, etc., usually write in the pattern called model view controller. There's actually two or three of these, but it's actually pretty simple, okay? And uh, it's actually so well known that everybody calls it MVC in the trade. And QT helps you implement that. And it looks something like this, that you have some kind of a model over here. You have some kind of a view module, and you have a controller that goes through this, these things. And you write effectively three different types of three different sections of software, and you write communications that go between them. Right? These things have been out for a long time. Effectively, um, QT helps you modify, helps you do these things, okay? It really helps you do the controller and have a section and a lot of the view because you can use a, a QGL viewer, QGL widget, D in here. You can use QGL uh, widget over here. You can use all the buttons and everything. And what QT does is it gives you a mechanism by which you can by which you can communicate between these things. Okay, um, that it uses the signals and slots here to allow you to communicate between these modules. Okay, it allows you to communicate between these modules using these signals and slots. And it's really kind of cool because when your controller senses that a button has been pressed, you can set up a signal, right, using the pressed signal of the button, right, and, and in the documentation all the signals are there that you can use. You can use the pressed signal for the button to signal your model that something should change. Okay, so if you want to, uh, if you want your Sierpinski curve to draw a certain uh, one level farther down, you can select a, select a button that says draw one more level, right? And when you press that button, you can send a signal, right? Use a signal in the controller, send a signal to a slot in model, right? Which contains your Sierpinski curve model, all right? The slot could change the Sierpinski curve and then send a signal to the viewer that says, okay, change the view on these things, okay? Change the view on this thing. 
It's very, very, it'll be very useful when we have viewers that want to rotate and rotate the model around and look at it from different angles. Because what will happen is we'll use some mechanism sliders or something on the screen to rotate our model. And every time we move the slider or something, it'll send a signal to our viewer to change the angle, the camera angle, right, well, from which we view things. And these things are, these things go, uh, signals and slots go beyond all these things. So what you have to do here is remember in your C++ classes to put the, the QT macro in there so that it knows about signals and slots when it compiles. Okay, so the QMake can, if you notice what QMake does, it sets up these little files. Uh, it, it has something called a mock compiler. It sets up these little, separate little programs called mock files. And these mock files get added to your regular files when the program compiles. What the mock does is it implements the signals and slots. Okay, it implements the signals and slots by what we call a subject observer pattern. Okay another pattern. It implements these signals and slots. It's actually closer to what we call publisher subscriber, but it's a signal, it's, a, it's an observer subject where a model is really observing, you can think of it as the a model is observing the controller, right? And whenever the controller has something happen, like a button being pressed or something, it notifies all of its observers that something has happened, right? And I'm the one it's happened with. It notifies all its observers, okay? And so typically, when you, when you implement this, the observer happens to know the this pointer, T-H-I-S pointer in C++, to the thing that it observes and that can then call a function back there and do something. One of the things that we have in graphics is the viewer typically is derived from QGL widget. We don't use QGL widget, it is a QGL widget. We derive a function from a QGL widget, right? Which makes it so we can use all the QGL widget functionality, but we really control everything, right? And we don't rewrite their functions. But over here in model, there's something called a draw routine. Everything has something called draw routines. So almost all of my, if you looked at a lot of my code, you would see that almost all my things in my code have a routine called draw. Draw me. Okay? And what happens then is that QGL widget, or my derived class, I usually call it canvas, and I have several types of canvases I can use. I usually call this canvas over here. But the canvas class has something called paintGL, right? which many of you have seen if you started writing code. It has a paintGL function. Right, what the paintGL function has is draw this over here. Okay? Use the draw function. All the paintGL command does have a couple draw functions in it, and the draw functions usually belong in the classes over in the model. So the models know how to draw themselves in general. All the models may do is draw triangles or draw whatever, but it's the canvas class that sets up the camera, the camera angle, and everything else we do. So these are model view controllers, and get used to writing your software this way, okay? Get used to writing your software this way. Quite frequently, we have several different models. We have several different types of controllers. We sometimes have three or four different views, right? You can have many QGL windows in one big window, for example, and have various views in here. And what we do is we continually um, continually tra uh, transmit, communicate between these pieces of software using signals and slots. Okay, if it weren't for signals and slots, I'd be teaching you teaching you the uh, pattern subject observer in this class, and we would use another piece of software. But QT has it already in there. So that's all signals and slots do. Signals, the slots, you set up these functions, and it sets up a, a nice little communication path, so you can signal something. Go over to something, go over to another routine and hit it and find a slot there. Okay? The slot will actually do something, and typically what the slot does over in model, it has it updates something and then calls uh, calls this guy, sends a signal over here that calls paint GL. Paint GL uses the draw routines over here, etc. And back and forth it goes. But it's called model view controller. Go over look, MVC, go over, look it up on the web if you like. Right? There's tons of stuff out there. But it's the way almost all of us code 
when we do graphics. We do this model view controller pattern. Where the viewing routines are over on one side, we think of it. The model, the uh, controller routines are in another place, and the model is, is kept separate as much as possible. To use signals and slots, you've got to use the, QG, the QT macro, though, in your .h files in order so it knows what signals and slots actually are. Okay? But that's what model view controller is, and it's used in everything. I'm teaching an iPhone class, and the very first thing we talk about in the iPhone class is model view controller. Right? That's the way everything's set up in there. Um, in Microsoft, on the Microsoft system, when you use .NET, model view controllers are just basically written right in for you. So you can use it. But everybody uses this. If you're interested in these design patterns, there's, there's actually several books to get. But there's a, one classic book called Design Patterns. I'm trying to think of the name of the person that wrote it. Uh, there's four of them. Um, but the, uh, I don't memorize the names. I, it's a blue book that says Design Patterns on the front. But go sit down on the bookstore and look through it. It's really cool. It's got actual C++ code in that you can use. But there's many things that you can do uh, in these programming languages that are uh, very, very easy to do. And the great thing about these things is they're easy to debug. Once you, they've actually thought about you know, how hard these things would be to debug. They're easy to debug if you do these, if you do these things. They're easy to use a debugger on if, they're, if you do these things because they separate your code out into very, very nice pieces. Okay, so this is what you're doing in reality. You're, you've got Chaikin's curve over here, Chaikin's curve stuff over here. You're viewing Chaikin's curves over here, right? So you've got some window set up to view it, and you've got the controller down here, which is accessing the buttons and everything else. That's the QT part mostly, right? And then you're setting up signals and slots to go between all these things. Right, to communicate around. And as you go on in this quarter, you'll keep doing this, and you'll find out it's really a cool way of writing code. You can really write code nice, quickly, etc. People don't think of writing like different modules and communicating between their own software pieces. They don't think of it that way. But we all do after a while. We think of it this way. We write different pieces of software and we communicate between them using these signals and slots. Uh, signals and slots with QT. So, um, and uh, for those of you who somebody says is QT actually used, right? Well, all your Linux window that you bring up, uh, you know, on your Linux machine, uh, the interface that you bring up is all written in Qt, so it is used. Okay, and what you download from Troll Trolltech is only a little piece of it. They give you the nice functionality. There's all kinds of extra stuff out there if you want to pay lots of money to Trolltech to use. Okay. Okay, so there's there's model view controller. Now, as, process, as promised, we're going to rotate around an arbitrary axis. Okay, we're going to rotate around an arbitrary axis today. And um, last time, I did something that said that showed you that we can generate four by four matrices, right? Remember the fourth column is always zero 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 one right now. But we can we can take these four by four matrices and we can um, rotate around at least three axes that we know well, right? The x axis, the y axis, and the z axis. We can rotate around those axes. What we want to do is we want to, however, we want to rotate around an arbitrary axis, and this is going to take a little bit of work. Okay, and I'm going to consider, say, a point here and an axis here, right? And I want to rotate that way, alpha. I want to rotate a point alpha around this line. Now, all these pictures are out on the website. If you don't like to draw pictures, well, while Ken's lecturing, okay, all these pictures are out on the website, and they're drawn pretty well. So. Uh, you can kind of watch and see. I want, I want this to make sense to you rather than you, you know, throw the toggle switch that says understand rather than take notes, okay, on, in your head. Um, because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use all these elementary matrices to get this done. The strategy is um, we know at least the part that we ought to transfer this point. You know, an axis is always a point and a vector, 
right? And we put our thumb along the vector. We want to go in the cupping direction of our fingers. That's the positive angle of rotation. Okay. So, I mean, intuition tells us just from the 2D, and you probably all got this part, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this point and translate it to the origin, okay? And then we're going to get this kind of vector sticking out of the origin, and what we're going to do is we're going to massage that vector until it actually coincides with one of the vectors, one of the axes we know all about, right? The X, the Y, or the Z. We're then going to rotate around that axis, and then we're going to undo everything, okay? So we're going to move, twist, right, rotate, untwist, and move back, right, in order to get it. So you can kind of see that this is going to be one transformation to move back and forth, actually two, right. There's going to be a couple to move down. There's going to be one. So there's going to be six or seven by the time we get done in here. They're all going to be four by four matrices. We're going to be able to actually multiply them all together and get one four by four matrix that actually rotates things around this axis, okay at a certain angle. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to do this across the blackboard here. Um, so the very first thing you want to do is you want to trend, oh, uh, let's see, I got, uh, let, me, let me call these things. Let's call this, uh, this point here X, P, Y, P, and Z, P. I'm going to need these things. Let's call the vector, nah, let's call it here. Here's P and here's V. Let's call the point P, XP, YP, and ZP. Let's call the vector V to be, uh, let's make brackets around it so it's a vector. XV, YV, and ZV. I'm going to need those coordinates here as I go along. Okay? So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to translate this whole thing. T of a minus XP, minus YP, and a minus ZP. Okay? That's the first thing I'm going to do. And that, that transfers this point down to the origin, right? If I subtract off all these things. And if you remember what this, this thing looked like, just picture in your head. It's a nice simple matrix. This is the only one I'm going to write down, okay? It looks like that, right? That's what the translation matrix looks like, okay? So I could take my point over here, any point, x, y, z, and 1, right, multiply it in, and I get another point out, which is translate. Okay, it's the last time I'm going to write one of the matrices down. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'll go over to the next blackboard. It'll take me about seven blackboards here. Uh, and now I have that point at the origin, and I have a vector coming out, right? This is the vector v. I'm going to draw everything. This is uh, x, y axis, z axis here. I'm going to draw everything as if, if it's in this quadrant in front, right? This, no, not quadrant, octant in front, right? There's eight of them. I'm going to draw everything because it's easiest, okay, to, to see. So what do you do once you're here? Now, we've got to manipulate this vector down to an axis that we know, right? I'll manipulate it down to the z axis here. Okay, we're going to manipulate it down to the axis to an axis that we know. So you drop a perpendicular from the tip of this vector down here, right? And let's draw these lines. Okay, like that. Can you see it? This vector sticking out in the middle of that octant. All right. And um, if I'm right, uh, this is xv here. That's zv, the distance because this vector is xv, yv, zv. And this dotted line here, the height of that is yv, right? When we get done. So, um, um, and this angle here, which I'm going to call theta for a second, I know that theta is equal to the angle whose tangent is uh, um, you like tangent inverse or you like arc tan? Right? Of, it is uh, the tangent ZV opposite, yeah, ZV, I hope so, over XV, like that. 
Okay, that's what theta is. Okay. And um, by the way, there are nice trig functions in the math library on any machine that calculate arctan of xv over zv. Usually they're called a tan, right? First parameter is xv, last parameter is z. Uh, first parameter is zv, second parameter is xv. There are nice routines to, call, to, arc, to calculate arctans. And if you look at this, what I'm going to do here now, let's look at the triangle here. This triangle. I'm going to move that triangle over into the yz plane. Okay? See it? I'm going to move that triangle over into the yz plane. How am I going to do that? I'm going to rotate around the y axis, right? Okay? And it's going to go against the cup against the cupping direction of my fingers, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say rotate minus theta around the y-axis. Uh, did I do it the other way? Okay. Y-axis, negative theta. I'm going to go minus theta. Whoops. Okay, this is why I got confused. Okay, hang on. All right. Before I get before I get really confused here, now I got to fix some stuff up because if that's theta, I put perpendiculars to the wrong stuff here. Okay, the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. Now I'm feeling better. Okay, which is x v over z v. Okay. Now now I'm okay. All right. Geometry is always fun. You can move angles around. You know. You just have to switch things around. Now, I'm going to move this minus theta, right? Okay? I'm going to move it minus theta. And it's going to co coincide now with the yz plane. It's going to be in the yz plane, that whole triangle, when I move it. So, what do I get? I now have this triangle. Here, here's the vector v, or now it's rotated, and it's in the yz plane. See it? It looks like it's in, close enough. Okay, it's in the yz plane. Now let's look at that angle. I'll call that one phi. Okay, see what I'm going to do next? All right, I'm going to rotate phi around the x-axis next. Okay. So here's phi. Let's write down phi. Phi is equal to, well, let's see. This is, we know that this distance is yv. And we know that because when we rotate something around the y-axis, we don't change the y-value of something, right? So we know what that is. But what's this one? Well, this one's a little messy. This one is the square root of x squared plus xv squared plus zv squared. Okay, a little less here, but there's nice square root functions, right, in all these things. So, phi here is arctan. The angle whose tangent is yv all over square root of xv squared plus zv squared. Okay. And now what I want to do is rotate right uh, around the x-axis phi, right? Cupping direction of my finger is okay in this one. I want to rotate it down. And when I get done, what I've got is now my vector is lying on, right, coincident. Co Incident, co-linear with the right z-axis. Okay, and now it's cool because what you can do is you can say, "Ha! Huh, now I want to rotate around the z-axis alpha, which was the original angle I wanted to rotate in the first place." Right? And now here's where a lot of people make a mistake and stop. You don't want to stop. Now what you've got to do is 
put it back. Okay? But putting it back is easy because all you got to do is reverse the steps that you've done before. So I need to then say re do around the x-axis minus phi rotate around the y-axis phi or, sorry, theta and translate by x p y p and z p. Okay, you see it? Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven four by four matrices to do this. But the cool thing is you can use these elementary matrices to build up something so you can do any matrix or any rotation. Okay? Any rotation around any axis you can do. And uh, um, this is uh, this is it's kind of cool, right? So what I can do is if I multiply T, R, 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 and T together, okay, I get one matrix out, four by four, does this rotation for me. Okay. So you're beginning to see why GPUs multiply four by four matrices really well. Okay? They do it really well. And the and uh, you know, we do it in parallel, um, and uh, there are many such things that we that we use in order to do this. So um, this is this is rotation about any axis. It's actually not that difficult to do when you see it done that way. It might be difficult to reproduce. Okay, and I'll ask you at some point. Write it down. He's going to ask us at some point to reproduce this. Okay. But the, uh, um, it's actually not bad at all to figure out how to rotate around any axis that you want. Now, um, uh, the space program discovered a few years ago that if you use 4x4 four four matrices and pile up rotations like this, you can get into a situation called gimbal lock where all of a sudden your face, spacecraft can flip over like 180 degrees really fast. And we have a new, a better system now from which we rotate. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do that till the end of the quarter because I'll completely blow you away if I do that. And that's called something called quaternions. Quaternions, we rotate. Pardon? Thank you. <laughs> that's something called quaternions. And Q. Oh, let's, okay. Let me do it. Hang on. Uh, something called a quaternion. And a quaternion originally came out in, I believe, about the 17th century uh, by a guy who was trying to, to uh, expand complex numbers. Complex numbers are A plus BI, right? Where you have an A and a B. And what he wanted to do was kind of get a more expanded one, A plus BI plus CJ. Another J-like, another I-like thing called J. And he wanted to expand it out into this type of a into a type of a system. Well, it turns out he couldn't. The math won't work out. But if you add a third one, bi plus cj plus dk, and you have i squared is minus one, j squared is minus one, k squared is minus one, and you figure out how i and j interact, and i times j equals k, and it, all these kind of things. If you do that, it works, and you can expand out. And so he called them quaternions. Right, and it turns out about uh, uh, 300 years later, right, or 200 years later, we learned how to quaternions turned out to be perfect to do rotations with. Okay, and I'll show you this. It perfect, and you don't get gimbal lock, which is the space the people in flying in the capsules are really happy about. Okay, you don't get this gimbal lock, which uh, with which mat with matrices you can get, uh, and you can go from a quaternion to a matrix really fast. So you can do all the work of quaternions, then generate a 4x4 four four matrix, feed that into OpenGL, and you're done. Okay. So most of us do things with, eventually with quaternions. Right? We do them with matrices, but we also do them with quaternions. I want to let you know that that one exists. Okay. Now, let's see. I have a few minutes. So uh, let me do 4D. All right. I'm going to need this. 
I'm going to need something called 4D perspective space. And I've got to draw pictures in four dimensions now, <laughs> which is going to kind of be interesting. Now, we, we have these uh, uh, points right, that we've described right? that look like this, x, y, z, and 1. All of our points have a 1 attached. And if you're a mathematician in the group, you say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's not really 3D space, that's 4D, right? Because there's a fourth element there. Okay? And you're right, it is 4D. And what we can do here is that we multiply these by matrices that, that do various things, but we restricted ourselves to the fact that this fourth column always had to be 0, 0, 1. Okay? Well, the question becomes, what, what happens if this fourth column isn't 0, 0, 1? And it's not going to be here once we start talking about cameras. It turns out it's going to be very convenient to have it not be 0, 0, 1. Well, if it's not 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, when you come out here, you get... You don't necessarily get 1 anymore out of this. Okay? If you have like a, a A, B, C in one, right, or A, B, C, even D, if you have A, B, C, and D here, you get A, X plus B, Y plus C, Z plus D, right? And it's like, oops, now I'm not in the X, Y, Z, one world anymore. What do I do? Okay, and um, this was kind of a. Uh, an interesting problem because you could see that you needed this. Okay, so let me draw you a, a 4D picture of what's happening. Okay, okay. Here's the. Uh, um, let's see. I'm going to call my coordinates x, y, z, and w now. Right. So here's the w axis. Okay, like this. Here's the W axis, and here's uh, the X and the X Y. Here's all the X and the Y and the Z axis, right? This is my four-dimensional picture. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to cheat. All right, that's the only way you can do it, right? Here's the X and Y and the Z axis all together, right? Okay, and what you have is is if you think about it for a second, our world sits here on the plane, the plane, the space, whatever. W equal one. That's where everything sits, okay? Because we have x, y, z, one on everything. All our frames and everything sit in this space, in some sense, because they've got a one attached to them. Now, what happens if I multiply it by a matrix which doesn't have a zero, 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 one anymore, right? As long as it is zero, 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 one, I stay in the space, right? I move around nicely in the space, okay? If it's not zero, zero, one, what happens is I move outside the space, and I get something out here. X, Y, Z, and W. Okay? I got something out there. And now I'm effectively in the soup. Okay? Well, everybody that looks at geometry or studies mathematics for a while says, oh, I know how to get back. Right? What you do is you just take this perpendicular projection back down to the W equal 1 axis. Okay, you just take this perpendicular projection down to the w equal one axis, and you call this point your real world point corresponding to that, and that basically says take this w here and make it one, right? If you want to project it down, it says take that w and just make it, force it to be one. Okay, well, turns out that doesn't work very well. Okay, but there is something that's really cool that does work well, and that says. And for us, it's going to make sense. And that is what they call projective space. Now, what projective space does is it projects this, uh, takes a line between that point, that's a straight line, I hope, that point and the origin, right? The origin is where x, y, z, and w are all zero. Takes a line between there and the origin, and it uses this point here as the space to get in. So. Um, what it does is it projects this line down, okay, and uh, um, right, uses this point here 
has the point in the XYZ1 world, uh, YZ1 world that you're going to correspond with some point outside. So if you force yourself outside this world in 4D, okay, you're starting to look really fuzzy here. When you force yourself out of this world in 4D, you get back by projecting this way. It's called projective space. Okay? Now, it's easy to it's easy to calculate this point. Because if you take drop perpendiculars to everything in sight here in my 4D picture, right? You can see that this distance here is W, right? That distance there is 1. Uh, let's pick one of our things for a second. That distance there is x, okay? And let's call this point x prime, y prime, and z prime, right? And 1. Let's call that one there because it's on the 1. You can see that this distance here is x prime. Okay, you got similar triangles running all over. Similar triangles say x prime is to 1 as x is to w, right? So x prime is to 1 as x is to w, and that says x prime is just x over w. So you can divide by w, right, to get x prime. Similarly, y prime is y over w, and z prime is z over w. So to get this projective, this new point in this projective space, all you do is divide by w, okay, and you get it there. Well, there's a couple kickers about dividing by w, right, that should irritate you. What happens if w is zero, for one thing, right? That's not good. But if w is 0, your original point is here on that thing, and a line through the center doesn't ever intersect that line, right? So, I mean, it kind of makes sense that w equals 0 doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, there's another one that if your point's down here, okay, if you draw a line through the origin here and intersect this line, it kind of goes to the other side, right? These are negative numbers maybe over here, and this is a positive number when you start. So it can flip over the sign, S-I-G-N, of these things. Eh, we don't worry too much about that, okay? Okay, now, one of my most favorite curves in the world today is this one, okay? It's, if I can, Uh, P of T. This is the coolest curve in the world. <laughs> Why, <laughs> you might say? It's uh, because it, it looks awful, right? When you start calculating it, it doesn't look very good at all. Think about it, it doesn't look very good at all. But if this is X and Y here, right, and we take X squared plus Y squared, you get uh, this squared, who? 1 minus t, I'll write it out, squared, all over 1 plus t squared squared plus 2t over 1 plus t squared squared, okay? Which is, uh, let's square this out, 1 minus 2t squared plus t to the fourth, all over, uh, this is 1 plus t squared squared, plus, square that, 4t squared over 1 plus t squared squared. And then on the top you get, add them up, you get 1 plus 2t squared plus t to the fourth, all over 1 plus t squared squared, and that is 1. Okay? So x squared plus y squared always happens to be 1. What is that curve? It's a circle of radius 1, right? Sure doesn't look like it, does it? Okay? Sure doesn't look like it, does it? Um, well, um, it also can be written in a different way. See? Let's, let's let, oh, draw a line here. Can we, so here's...
So this is kind of the uh, add the one that we would normally do. I'm going to do a 2D thing here. I can write this this way. Okay, I'm going to write it this way. In which this way it looks like a parabola. Oh my god, right? Just got squared terms on it. Looks like a parabola. <laughs> All right? But if I use this principle that I pr when I go off my space x, y, 1, I get back by dividing by w, okay? Then these two are the same thing because if I divide by now the new w over here, I get that, right? So I can go back and forth by dividing by w. This says that if I write down this parabola, right, it actually projects to a circle. Okay? It actually projects down to a circle. You have to kind of look at this and it's this parabola kind of going up like this to infinity, and then when you project it all down, right, you kind of lose all the height that you're getting from the w part, the 1 plus t squared part. You project it down, you get a circle down on the base. Okay? And this, this actually started a new field of study called rational splines because uh, things where you could they had the same denominator but you could take it out and deal with it in 4D space. I've got only 3D here. Okay. But the cool thing about this is that, um, are you really lost yet? Okay. This is 4D now. Okay. The cool thing about this is as follows. If I look at this type of a thing here, right here. If I look at this type of a thing, this looks very much like putting a camera here, okay? Working out and having a, I've got this, I can only draw two, I can only got draw 2D. Having a rectangular window out here, having this camera come out. And if we think of a box, cam, a pinhole camera with a little piece of film in the back, a rectangular piece of film, what happens when you project that out through the hole, you get this pyramid, right, going out. You get this pyramid going out. And what you want to do is you want to project your points on the pyramid down onto the film, okay? You want to project your points onto the film. Now, we in graphics don't put our film behind like we have to do as human beings. We actually can simulate it, put our film in front. But this model of this 4D model actually looks like something where you can project your points, right, radially, obliquely project points down onto film and get it to work out. And this is why we're going to use this model. And believe it or not, the only thing we can take things off of this axis, this XYZ1 world. In order to get them back on, we have to project them down. Projecting them down is easy. All you do is divide by this last component. Okay? So we can so what we're going to do now is some invent some matrices, right, that have not 0, 0, 1 in that fourth column, but something else. Okay, it'll actually be really simple. Okay, something else in that fourth column, and what that'll do is uh, it'll move us out of our XYZ1 world, but we'll be able to project back down and get it in. And this combination of this matrix plus this projection, right, will enable us to simulate a camera, right, and do a perspective view in a camera. So that's why we have to do it, is because this arrangement here makes it look like a perspective view. All these points down, well, it doesn't make any sense to uh, have a, well, the W equals zero points don't make it much sense to, even in the camera analogy here, right? They're kind of out there the same where my camera is, right? And I can't see them. The points behind us are going to be a problem because when we do the projection, they go back in front of us. And the things behind us tend to go upside down and backwards in front of us when we do these projections, right? So if we have this building, we model this entire building, the black, as I'm looking out here, the blackboard would go upside down and backwards in front of me, right? And look kind of silly, all right? So we have to figure out how to get rid of those guys kind of before. Pardon? 
multiply by zero? Multiply by, that'd be a nice way, yeah. <laughs> that'd be a nice way. Actually, we're going to invent a little process called clipping to do it. Okay, it's called clipping, and it clips things up. W is less than one, but greater than zero? If it's less than one, then greater than zero, same thing. You, except it goes, you have to draw the line. It goes way out here. Okay, so it expands out. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out how to limit ourselves to this this pyramid that goes out away from us. Okay, and and it's called the viewing pyramid. Believe it or not, okay, it's called the viewing pyramid. And uh, typically, what we do is we look at this, put things in this viewing pyramid, and view them. And this is there are some routines in OpenGL that do exactly this. Okay, do exactly this. And so what we got here is we've got kind of a uh, cool little model comes from 4D projective space, okay? The, the 4D is a little hard to accept until you see all of a sudden that, ooh, hey, this just looks like the pyramid coming out of a uh, pinhole camera, right? And maybe I can use this, and it turns out we can. And it's going to be the divide by W stuff that we use, okay? And uh, when you send stuff down into your GPU, right, this is what it does. It is eventually, for all your XYZ coordinates, it tacks on a 1, Right, multiplies things on, it's going to get a W out at the end. It delays and delays and delays and delays, and finally at the end it divides by W, right, and gets the points out. Um, and uh, it's really kind of cool how this whole thing is going to work out, okay? So this is what we have to do, um, and uh, um, I'm going to start doing that on Monday. Today's Friday? Today's Friday. Right, I'm going to start doing that on Monday. And uh, um, I have a uh, um, about a lecture and a half to get the camera transform out of the way, and then we'll be able to place a camera anyway, anywhere we want in space, and move it around, and that'll be fun. So, okay, have a good weekend.